and we're looking at what we can do to strengthen our cyber resilience and data infrastructure all the time as new technology develops. Bob Blackman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank my honourable friend for that answer. Clearly, it's vital that the enormous amounts of personal data that are collected by government departments and private companies must be safeguarded. I've had a number of complaints to me about people's personal data being abused by companies and indeed uh, from the public sector it being sold to uh, companies who then use it. Just this weekend, our GLA candidate had his phone hacked and his social media destroyed. That's equally important as a demonstration of what can happen to democracy when data is abused. So can my honourable friend take further action to safeguard people's personal data? Well, I, I thank him for highlighting that case, and I, I regret uh, what's happened to the GLA candidate. Uh, and it, it does uh, highlight some of the risks that we all carry uh, it, in relation to technology. Um, that's why we have a very high data protection standards, but also we, there's a range of ways in which we need to tackle this problem. We have the National Cyber uh, Strategy, which is working to make sure that we can deal with the cyber threats that we face. We're taking uh, measures to uh, protect our data infrastructure, uh, to trying to do things to stop fraud in the National uh, Fit Stop Think Fraud Strategy, uh, and new laws on security of devices like connected devices. So there's a whole range of things we need to do, but we need to keep making sure that we're vigilant about the risks. Jamie Stone. Mr. Speaker, when my 91-year-old mother died, for purely sentimental reasons, I took on her landline. For months and months and months after that, I kept on getting scam calls offering all sorts of dodgy products. Does the minister agree with me that the elderly must have their, their ID, their personal data protected more than, almost more than anyone? Well, I'm sorry to hear about the experience of my old friend's mother, and I'm afraid it's one that's shared by uh, constituents across the country. That's why we have taken new measures in the data bill to try and deal with these problems of scam calls and try and make sure we can see data and see where those numbers are and take action so we can block uh, uh, them on bulk. Um, but I appreciate what he's saying, and it's something that we must tackle. Senator Minister Chris Evans. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We are told this year is general election year. Already in other countries, we have seen those who want to de manipulate democracy use AI to scrape together personal details, like someone's face and voice, allowing them to falsify candidates' views. And I think it was quite pertinent the Honourable Member for Harrow East raised that about a GLA candidate. As we quickly approach the second half of the year, when we are told the Prime Minister will finally, finally call the election, will the government commit to ensure personal details are protected for candidates, voters, and above all, democracy as a matter of urgency. Yeah. Well, we absolutely share those concerns. That's why we have a Defending Democracy Task Force that's working across every government department to look at the threats to our democracy. And it's a very substantial threat that we face and one that we all have to be mindful of in, every, in the way in which we conduct ourselves as candidates. Uh, AI and, and fakes and uh, the protection of data is one element of that, but I want to assure the House that we have a whole range of measures that we're taking to make sure that the protection of this coming general election is robust. Then Peace spokesperson Carol Monaghan. Thank you, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Individuals' personal data is not safe in Tory hands. A recent article in The Guardian reported that senior Tory party officials plan to make millions from selling off their own members' data through the ah. True Blue app. Now, if the Tory party is happy to sell off personal data of their own members, how can the public possibly have right. confidence <laughs> that their data is safe under this government. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, the, the, the allegations that the lady has put forward, I mean, I, I, they were written in The Guardian. They're not any that I have seen myself. I'm presiding over the data bill. I've seen no evidence to suggest that we are trying to bring forward laws that would do such things. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ofcom is the independent regulator of the Online Safety Act. The government is working with them to implement the Act as quickly as possible, including the relevant secondary legislation. Ofcom is taking a phased approach to bringing the duties into effect and is consulting on guidance and codes of practice. Offences around serious online abuse came into effect the 31st of January this year. Thank you, Paul. The Online Safety Act did introduce many measures to keep children safe online. But given the increased concerns about children's online safety, does she agree it is now time to go even further and introduce a child safe phone, thus ensuring that at a minimum all phones intended for children are properly fitted with parental controls 
to stop children from accessing harmful content. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Indeed, the government did produce world-leading legislation when it comes to online safety, which puts the onus on social media companies and not the parents. I know that my honourable friend has spoken about information before, which is particularly important in making it as easy as possible for parents. She does raise an important point regarding device level controls, and I can assure her that I'm listening not just to members of this House, but also to parents too. Alex Davis Jones. Yesterday, the government finally backed Labour's cause and announced they would be making the creation of deep fake porn a criminal exactly. offence. Uh, However, uh, it is disappointing that the government continue to adopt an intent based approach over one of consent in relation to these crimes. Why are ministers prioritising a man's right to have banter over a woman's right to feel safe? And will the government look at the regulation of the AI apps such as Nudify and Cloth Off, which are freely available, easy to use, and exist only to humiliate and violate women? Thank you, Mr Speaker. I share the Honourable Member's passion for this area. It's why we put it in the Online Safety Act in regards to the sharing of this content. And now we have gone one step further and made it illegal, uh, well, we're in the process of making it illegal to create this content in the first place. Stuart C. MacDonald. Number seven, please, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The government is clear that artificial intelligence is the defining technology of our time with the potential to transform humanity positively. But it also recognises the challenges that AI can uh, pose. As has already been said, we are working to ensure that we respond to the full range of threats to our democ democratic processes, including through the DEFDEM task force. Task force. DSIT is engaging with social media platforms, civil society groups, academia, and international partners to tackle the risk AI can pose to democracy. Stuart C. MacDonald. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the longer term, I absolutely agree. AI has enormous potential to support participation in politics, and we should seek to harness that. But in the short term, disinformation and deepfakes, often put together by foreign actors, threaten to have the most immediate impact on democracy. So what risk does he believe that AI poses to this year's election in particular, and what steps is he taking to alleviate those risks? Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, let me be very, very clear. The UK will not tolerate malicious cyber activity targeting our democratic institutions. We've already had uh, the Deputy Prime Minister come to this dispatch box and take definitive action where that has happened. DEFDEM and government teams are working collaboratively to ensure that we can respond uh, to threats to our democratic processes, including digitally manipulated content. And the Online Safety Act will also force companies to take proactive, preventative action against legal state-sponsored content online via the Foreign inter Interference Offence, including deep fakes and other AI-generated uh, content in scope of the uh, Good Lee, uh, in two short sentences, will the Minister reassure us that AI is not going to destroy, just not just destroy democracy, but the human race as well? <laughs> in, in two sentences, Mr Speaker, uh, I, I can confirm that uh, the government is taking a proactive approach to AI, uh, full stop, uh, and that DEFDEM uh, is working very hard to protect our democratic processes, full stop. Become the topical Samja. Number one, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I want the British people to be able to seize the extraordinary opportunities that AI offers, but that can only happen if we address the risk. At Bletchley Park, we kick-started a global conversation, and since then, the Bletchley effect has seen countries from around the world collaborating on the development of safe, responsible and trustworthy AI. Two weeks ago, I signed an agreement with the United States allowing us to collaborate seamlessly on AI safety testing. And last week, we announced the date of the second AI safety summit in Seoul. We also remain laser focused on implementing the landmark Online Safety Act, which will make Britain the safest place to be online. And last month, we saw the first sentencing under the cyber flashing offences that we brought in in January. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A fast and reliable internet connection is vital for everyday life and so many local businesses. Yeah. I conducted a broadband survey in East Devon. Some rural parts of my constituency still sadly lag behind. Sidbury, Fluxton, Marsh Green and Tallerton. What steps is the government taking to make sure that broadband providers improve connections across our county? Yeah. Well, I'm glad to say that over 75% of premises in his constituency can access gigabit cable broadband. That's up from 6% in 2019, but we want to do more, so we've included Mid and East Devon in our cross-regional framework for Project Gigabit, and that's currently undertaking free procurement market engagement, and we hope to be given the news very soon. Shall the Secretary Peter Kyle? Yeah. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The first act of this Prime Minister was to promise a government of professionalism and integrity. Yet here we have a Secretary of State who uses her position to accuse a British scientist of being a terrorist sympathiser. She goes on to use public money to settle her liable, and then she tries to cover up just how much taxpayers' money she wasted. Can she tell the House, are these the actions of someone with integrity and professionalism, yes or no? Thank you, Mr Speaker. As the Minister responsible for UKRI, officials in my department alerted me to a tweet which stated, this is disturbing. Suella Braverman urges police to crack down on Hamas support in the UK with no further context or wording. This was posted by a representative of an EDI board that sits under UKRI. At the time, like many others, I was indeed concerned and used the forum in which she used to alert UKRI to my concerns. This was highlighted using that medium, but on receipt of the letter, UKRI CEO themselves said that they were deeply concerned and launched an investigation. Thank you for Mr Speaker, WhatsApp can be very handy, but it can also be very dangerous. Its end-to-end -end encryption means even the most vile illegal content like child sexual abuse cannot be policed or prevented. Given the obvious dangers to children, does she agree that it is woefully irresponsible of Meta to reduce the age for WhatsApp to 13? Thank you, Mr Speaker. We are pro-innovation but also pro-privacy. However, it is clearly not right for anyone to be exposed to such harms as sexual abuse, extortion or grooming on any service. Platforms must have robust processes in place to safeguard children in response to the Online Safety Act. Responsible encryption has an important role to play in protecting privacy, but it shouldn't compromise safety. And Ofcom will take robust action when this is compromised. John Young, on the action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At the Lord Science Committee, the Secretary of State said there had been no surveillance of academics in that case. Mr. Speaker, what was the evidence which she based her decision to write to the UKRI chief exec on then? Yeah. Mr Speaker, I've answered that multiple times. An official alerted me to these concerns. I then saw the tweet myself, and also I asked the department for further advice. The catering-based company Intertech is the only company in the world that can manufacture and completely recycle circuit board technology. The potential for it and for the UK is huge. Would the Minister for Science, Research and Innovation be kind enough, please, to visit Intertech and Kettering to see this groundbreaking innovation for himself. Mr Speaker, Intertech is indeed a great example of innovation in sustainable electronics. I was pleased that they benefited from a quarter of a million pounds in UK support, and it would be my pleasure to visit my honourable friend's constituency in Kettering, uh, and I believe we've got a date soon. Gregory Campbell. Gregory Campbell. Mr Speaker, Northern Ireland should have virtually 100% access to fibre broadband which is a first in any of these islands, following the confidence and supply agreement with the previous government. Does he agree with me that regions like Northern Ireland and other regions in the UK should take full advantage of that broadband access, broadband access to maximise employment opportunities across these islands? Absolutely, he's uh, right about the importance of giving the broadband to the economy. And I'm very glad to say that 95% of Northern Ireland has that access, so it's, it's the highest percentage in the country, and that's a tribute to the work done between the central government and the Assembly. Sir why should people living in rural areas be second-class citizens when it comes to mobile phone coverage? Well, we agree. That's why we have the short, shared rural network programme that is dealing with a lot of those not-spot problems. Tim Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, the number of black students entering into STEM are leaving in great numbers. So can you say what you're doing to identify the challenges and what you're doing to help regression of black students in STEM? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the government is absolutely committed to expanding STEM opportunities. A key way of doing that is building mathematical capabilities, helping girls and minorities stick with maths. That's why the Prime Minister announced our ambition to see all young people receive maths education until age 18. Another question, Nigel Mills. Amber Valley has a high incidence of respiratory disease, so what more can the government do 
to increase investment in research into respiratory conditions in the areas that need that research the most. Um, the, uh, the Medical Research Council is benefiting from the highest ever level of research spend. I'd be very happy to meet with my honourable friend to talk about what more we can do in this important area. We now come to Prime Minister's questions. Sir Lynn Saxby. Question one, please, Mr Speaker. Hi, Minister. Mr Speaker, we are joined today in the gallery by postmasters caught up in the Horizon IT scandal. It is one of the greatest miscarriages of justice in our history, and that is why we have introduced a bill to quash convictions, delivered schemes to ensure swift compensation, and established an independent inquiry. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Mr. Yeah. Speaker, does my right honourable friend agree towns like Barnstable, the main transport hub in North Devon, serving hundreds of square miles, should have a fully functioning bus station? As Lib Dem run North Devon Council has not reopened out since the pandemic, leaving residents out in the cold with oh, no, no public no. facilities. Oh, as people start to feel the difference with tax cuts and falling inflation, does he agree we should be making it easier for people to use the bus, come to town and support Barnstable's local economy? And will my right honourable friend join me in calling on the Lib Dems to get on with reopening the bus station? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, we know how vital bus services are for communities right across the country. That's why we're providing Devon with £17 million to deliver better bus services. And we introduced the £2 fair bus cap. But I know my honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Transport, was recently visiting my uh, honourable friend, seeing the benefits of reopening Barnstable bus station. And it's clear that the local Liberal Democrats should just get on and do it. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Uh, can I too welcome the postmasters in the gallery in their quest for justice? And Mr Speaker, this week we marked 35 years since the disaster at Hillsborough. Oh, yeah. And the enduring courage and determination of the families must be marked by the passing of a Hillsborough law. Yeah. <laughs> Mr Speaker, we also lost Lord Richard Rosser, a lifelong member of the Labour Party. He will be greatly missed, and our thoughts are with his wife, Sheena, his family and friends. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I'm privileged to be the proud owner of a copy of the former Prime Minister's new book, <laughs> it's a rare, unsigned copy. <laughs> it's quite the, it's the only unsigned copy. It's quite the read. She claims the Tory party's disastrous kamikaze budget that triggered chaos for millions was, her words, the happiest moment of her premiership. <laughs> Has the Prime Minister met anyone with a mortgage who agrees? <laughs> Well, Mr Speaker, all I'd say is he uh, ought to spend a bit less time reading that book and a bit, and a bit, more, and a bit more time reading the Deputy Leader's tax advice. I think we've got less talking. Oh, oh. I want to get through PMQs. Here's Starmer. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. We've got a billionaire Prime Minister yeah. and a billionaire Prime Minister, both of, both of whose families have used schemes to avoid millions of pounds of tax, smearing a working class woman. And the Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister, has a long list of people to blame for the economic misery. They don't want to hear it. They've made her Prime Minister. And millions of people are paying the price. She's got a long list of people to blame. She blames the Governor of the Bank of England, the Treasury, the Office for Budget Responsibility. The American President is blamed at one point. We even learned that the poor old lettuce was part of the deep state. <laughs> Does the Prime Minister agree with me that it's actually much simpler than that? It was the Tories' unfunded tax cuts, yeah. tens of billions of pounds of unfunded tax cuts, that crashed the economy and left millions paying more on their mortgages, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. 
Mr. Mr. Speaker, everyone knows that two years ago I wasn't afraid to repeatedly warn about what her economic policies would lead to, even if it wasn't what people wanted to hear at the time. Mr. Speaker, I was right. I was right then. But I'm also right now when I say that his economic policies would be a disaster for Britain. He would send inflation up, mortgages up and taxes up and working people would pay the price. Well, I appreciate the Prime Minister having the stomach to say it out loud, but everyone knows it's the Tory party's obsession with wild, unfunded tax cuts that crash the economy. We know it. He knows it, they know it, yeah. and the whole country yeah. is living it. Yeah. So when is he finally going to learn the lesson from his predecessor's mistakes and explain where the money is coming from for his own completely unfunded £46 billion yeah. promise yeah. to scrap national insurance? Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker when, when my predecessor was running for leader, to use his words, I did have the stomach to argue out loud about her economic policies, had the conviction to say that they were wrong. But not once, but twice, he tried to make his predecessor prime minister. Despite, despite him opposing NATO and Trident, ignoring anti-Semitism and siding with our enemies. It's clear what he did. He put his own interests ahead of Britain's. I think actually when he was running for Prime Minister, uh, for leader, he, he was explaining how he's funneling money from poor areas to pay it into richer areas. We know what his record is. But I, I notice he's not denying the £46 billion promise to scrap the national insurance, but he's refusing to say where the money will come from. And we've been trying for months to get to the bottom of this. So now's his chance. No more spin, no more waffle, no more diversion. I know that'll be difficult. He can either, Mr Speaker, this is the choice, he can either cut state pension or the NHS, the national insurance funds, that's route one, or he can put up income tax. Which one is it? Prime Minister, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, we've just cut taxes by £900 for a typical worker. We've delivered the biggest tax cut for businesses since the 1980s. But while we're cutting taxes, Labour is already putting them up. In Wales, putting up taxes right now for small businesses. In Birmingham, putting up council tax by 21%. And in London, in London, his mayor has put up taxes by 70%, Mr Speaker. And this is just a glimpse of what they'd do if they got in power. A few weeks ago, he finally admitted it to The Sun. What would he say he would do? I quote, he said, we would put up taxes. It's always the same, Mr Speaker. Higher taxes and working people paying the price. No single politician has ever put tax up more times than he has. But, but, but Mr Speaker, uh, just hang on, because he was given the chance, he was, no, he was just given the chance to rule out cutting the NHS or state pensions to pay for scrapping this no, he's, I, I was a lawyer long enough to know when someone's avoiding the question. So I, I'm going to give him another chance. Will he now rule out, cuts the NHS, cuts the state pension, or putting up taxes to pay for his unfunded £46 billion promise to scrap national insurance? Which is it? Mr Speaker, I make absolutely no apology about wanting to end the unfairness of the double taxation on work, Mr Speaker. The NHS is receiving record funding under this Conservative government. Pensioners have just received a £900 increase under this government. But if he wants to talk about tax, let's have a look at what Labour's brand newly appointed tax adviser has to say. But this adviser this advisor thinks that supporting pensioners is a complete disgrace, Mr Speaker. He believes their free TV licences are ridiculous. And if it wasn't bad enough, this adviser has called for increases in income tax, in national insurance and VAT. Now, it all makes sense now. That's who the Shadow Chancellor has been copying and pasting from. So, so, so this is genuinely extraordinary. Two chances, two chances... 
to rule out, Mr. Speaker, two chances to rule out cuts to state pension, yeah. cuts to the NHS, yeah. or income no, no, tax no, no, no. rises to fund his no, no, no. promise to abolish national insurance. Order, order, order. Mr. Hall, I want you to set a good example, not a bad one. Keep stand. <laughs> Mr Speaker, th this really matters. He's had two chances to rule out these cuts. Cuts to NHS, cuts to uh, tax or, or pensions or tax rates. This matters to millions of people watching who want to know what's going to happen for NHS and pensions. Uh, it really does matter to millions of people who are watching. So I'll be really generous now and give him one last chance. Very simple, very clear. Is his £46 billion promise to abolish national insurance being paid for by cuts to the NHS, cuts to the state pension, or yet another Tory tax rise? Yeah. M Mr. Mr Speaker, he's really got to keep up, Mr Speaker. Right? It's, it's, this, it's this government that's just delivered a £900 increase to the state pension. It's this government that's already committed to the triple lock for the next parliament. Yeah. Uh, he, he had six opportunities. I didn't think I heard him say that, Mr Speaker. And when it comes to the NHS, you'd much rather be treated in Conservative-run NHS in England, not the Labour-run NHS in Wales, Mr Speaker. But it's another week where all we heard is political sniping, Mr Speaker, not a word about their plans for the country. He's failed to acknowledge that since we last met, taxes have been cut by £900, state pensions gone up, free childcare has been expanded, wages have risen for nine months in a row, Mr Speaker, and just today, inflation down again to 3.2%. Our plan is working, and the Conservatives are delivering a brighter future for Britain. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you will not be surprised to learn that I'm very much welcome the £20 million allocated to Colton in my Gedney constituency yeah. as part of the long term plan to tie up to towns. But I'm very eager to see that this money is spent according to local wishes. I know there'll be consultations following the setting up of the towns board. So Will my right honourable friend join me in urging Colton residents to take part in those forthcoming consultations to make sure their voices are heard and to ensure that this money is spent where the people want? Yeah. Can I thank my honourable friend for his tireless campaigning on behalf of the residents of Carlton? Our long-term plan for towns means that 75 towns across the country, including Carlton, will benefit from £20 million each to invest in their local area, but crucially, as he said, that will be in the hands of local people deciding on their priorities for the place that we live. Whether it's regenerating local high streets, investing in parks and green spaces, or tackling antisocial behaviour, we're levelling up across the country, and he deserves enormous praise for his role in securing that investment. SNP yeah. leader Stephen Flint. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr Speaker. This week, a former Prime Minister who oversaw a financial crash before being unceremoniously tuffed from office told the public the truth, and I'm not referring to that one, Mr Speaker, <laughs> because on Monday, Gordon Brown told the people of these aisles that the forces pulling Britain apart are greater than the forces holding it together. So maybe the Prime Minister can find some time this afternoon to perhaps agree with just one of his predecessors. Oh, look, Mr Speaker, <laughs> where I do agree with my predecessor very strongly is that Scotland would be far stronger inside the United Kingdom. Stephen Flynn. But Mr Speaker, of course, where Gordon Brown was also correct was in stating that Scottish independence is not simply off the agenda. And indeed, those remarks were echoed just yesterday by the General Secretary of the Scottish Trade Union Congress, who stated that it remains an unresolved issue, Mr Speaker before going on to state, and I confirm, and they may laugh at her, but she said, that can be a very dangerous place to end up in when you are not allowing people to express their wishes in a democratic <laughs> manner. So may I ask... So may I ask the... So may I ask the Prime Minister, does he welcome the fulsome, wholehearted and warm support of the Labour Party in denying the people of Scotland that opportunity to have a say over their own future. Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, we did have a democratic vote on that topic. Uh, but what I would suggest 
to the SNP is that rather than obsessing about independence yeah. and indeed wasting time cracking down on free speech and trying to lock yeah. up JK Rowling, he should focus on what the people of Scotland actually care about, schools, hospitals, jobs and our new tax cuts. Yeah. Yeah. Andrea Jenkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I abhor a two-tier policing system and we must ensure that everyone's treated equally under the rule of law. The Labour Police and Crime Commissioner who investigated the Vgate scandal handed their police chief constable a new three-year contract whilst the investigation into the Labour Party leader and deputy leader was ongoing. Now, two former Labour MPs are overseeing the force due to investigate the opposition deputy leader. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that complete transparency throughout this investigation is of the utmost importance? Yeah. Yeah. My uh, right honourable friend makes an important point. A key principle of our country is that there are the same rules for everyone. And when it comes to this topic, I do think the Labour leader should show some leadership. Avoid stop reading the legal advice. Simply just publish it and get a grip of the situation. And it says a lot about his priorities, that when it comes to his famed legal expertise, he's more than happy to help defend his butcheria, but refuses to help his own deputy leader. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The recently published Canova report makes it absolutely clear that the IRA was riddled with British agents uh, from top to bottom. Those agents were involved in abduction, torture and murder of British and Irish citizens. The British government, successive British governments, knew all about it and did nothing. The report also calls for an apology from the government to those victims. Will the, will the Prime Minister take this opportunity now to make that apology? Well, Mr Speaker, as the Honourable Gentleman will know, this is an interim report, as the Secretary of State has laid out. We can't comment on the findings until we get the final report, but we would never condone wrongdoing where there is evidence of this. But I will say this also, because it's not said enough, the overwhelming majority of the police, armed forces, and intelligence services served with great distinction. Yes. They defended democracy in the face of some horrendous violence, and without their service and their sacrifice, there would have been no peace process. They helped ensure that the future of Northern Ireland will never be decided by violence, but by the consent of its people. Yeah. Yeah. So, Simon yeah. Clark, yeah. 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 does my uh, right honourable friend agree with me? Uh, we don't agree on everything, but we do, do agree on this, that if anyone wants to see why this government has introduced strong mayors, they need only look to Ben Houchen yeah. in the Tees Valley. Yeah. Yeah. From saving our airport to introducing our free port to bringing steel making back, Ben delivers. And does my right honourable friend agree with me? That the best thing that Ben has done is do this without charging any mayoral tax, oh, which his Labour opponent oh, would need to do to fund his unfunded spending plans. Well, my honourable friend is absolutely right to raise the great work of Ben Houchin, and I share his concerns about the pledges of the Labour candidate. Over £130 million of unfunded spending, showing that Labour can't be trusted. And we all see the results of this, Mr Speaker, in Labour run Birmingham. Taxes going up by 20%. And that is the story of what Labour in local government means. Working people paying the price. And it's exactly why he and I completely agree on this. The people of Teesside should vote Ben Houchin and vote Conservative. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Last year in Shropshire, 10,000 people waited for more than 24 hours in A&E. That's 10,000 people over 65 waiting on hard plastic chairs or in trolleys in our accident and emergency department. The Prime Minister tells us he's got a plan for the NHS, but what people in North Shropshire want to know is how long they are going to have to wait for him to get on and fix the issues where we are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, with the record funding that we're putting into the NHS. Our urgent emergency care plan is delivering more ambulances, more beds, but also faster discharge through our hospitals to speed the flow. And that plan is working, of course, more to do. But this winter, we saw ambulance and A&E waiting times improve from the year before uh, for the first time in many years. And if we stick to the plan, we'll continue to deliver improvement for her constituents and everyone else. Gareth Johnson. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, in 2010, somebody earning £15,000 a year paid £1,700 in income tax. Today, somebody earning £15,000 a year pays less than £500 of tax. So does the Prime Minister agree with me that this has helped create jobs, 
and self-reliant. Yeah. My honourable friend is quite right, and because of our plan, the economy after a tough few years has indeed turned the corner. Inflation has fallen from over 11%. 3.2 percent it forecast a return back to target in just a few months a year ahead of expectations and that's why Mr. Speaker, we've been able to cut people's taxes the tax cut as he mentioned worth not down for an average worker which by the way is part of our plan to end the long-term unfairness of the double taxation on work thank you mr speaker four years ago my constituent juliana and raped by her then boyfriend after his conviction juliana was advised that a transcript of his trial would help her come to terms with her experience but when she requested that transcript she was told that she would have to pay more